Hello everyone, today we are going to be talking about the idea of a federalized Europe and why I think it's a good idea. My previous video on the subject didn't really fit my overall content style, so this would be my second take. So in this video we are going to be talking about the following. A quick summary of what a European federation would look like, a discussion of the most relevant arguments against it, me presenting my arguments for it in light of what we heard so far, then we take a look at how feasible all of it really is, and finally how I would have the federalization process play out. Oh and uh, if my voice sounds a bit different in this video, that's because I been a bit sick lately. So let's get to it, shall we? What do we understand under a European Federation? It's a system of governance where the local governments transfer some of their tasks to an overarching federal body so that those tasks can be better coordinated on a continental level. And here I'd like to make a note that federalization doesn't involve centralizing everything. Uh, we're not the Soviet Union after all. As we'll see later on, we're talking about the strategic centralization of certain parts of government. Decisions about local issues would continue to be made locally, of course, unless they contradict some kind of overarching goal. So in practice, in a European Federation, the European Parliament would be an analog for the House of Representatives and the European Commission would be an analog for the Senate. Of course I'm talking about the US government here. The President would either be nominated by the parties or directly elected. A European Federation would also involve common military, common foreign affairs, common finances, and a common border security and asylum system, among other things. So this is my rough sketch of what a European Federation would look like. So basically certain key aspects of government would be under common federal control. So would this system be viable? Let's find out after a brief word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering all kinds of interesting subjects. Stuff like interior design, or how to properly care for your house plans, or the essentials of drawing, or how to study for exams, or how to boost your productivity. I myself am doing a class right now about Adobe Illustrator by Dan Kulken and Nathan Goldman. And it's super cool! It's very practical, intuitive, and easy to follow. And a very important thing for me personally, Skillshare curates its content specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads no hidden paywalls, no bait and switches, you are free to explore absolutely everything. And guess what? Skillshare is now running a promotion. That means the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a 1 month free trial of Skillshare. Thank you for checking out Skillshare, ads like these help support what I do. And now, on with the program. Before the recording of this video, I asked you to give me your best arguments against the European Federation. I've read lots of great responses, so thank you for taking your time. From all that you've written, I've collected the most relevant and most often recurring and I would say best arguments against the Federation, and now we're going to address them one by one. Now almost all counter-arguments involve some kind of rift within Europe, which could make the Federation idea non-viable. Irreconcilable differences, as they say. But are they? The first argument is the conservative versus progressive divide. For example, Sweden is a a haven of progressivism while Poland is the European Taliban. And the argument of course is that the ideological rift between the conservative and progressive parts of Europe is so large that the European Federation would be non-viable because of that. Now I think the main issue with this argument is that it views countries as these homogenous blocks. For example, even Poland has a huge conservative versus progressive divide. Polish cities are progressive while the Polish countryside is conservative. That being said, even the most conservative European countries are slowly becoming more and more progressive. According to this Pew Research data, young people are far more accepting of LGBT rights, for example, than older people. And this is the case in every Eastern European country that we would consider conservative. Okay, but what about the political forces of these countries? Hungary and Poland, for example, are led by ultra-conservative far-right governments. Well, both in Poland and Hungary, if you add up the conservative and the progressive forces, they are pretty much neck and neck. And in Hungary, for example, all those huge percentage numbers that Fidesz, Viktor Orban's party produced, are essentially just one-third of the population, two-thirds being uh, opposition or just apolitical. In other words, this conservative versus progressive divide is not that deep, and with time it will only get smaller. So I don't think the conservative progressive divide would be such a big problem, I mean we already have it and things aren't falling apart really. Let's move on to another frequent argument, namely the rich poor divide within Europe. And the gist of this argument is that the great wealth differences between countries, or in this case regions, would lead to all kinds of distortions, economic that is, such as internal mass migration, uh, poorer regions getting abandoned, etc. Now of course there are significant economic differences between European countries, but this is something that a federalized Europe could actually help solve in my opinion. For example, a federal anti-corruption court could oversee the spending of cohesion funds, sort of like OLAF right now, but on steroids. Less corruption on the poorer ends would definitely help with the economic situation. Also, a federal healthcare budget would do wonders to poorer member states. Ideally, there should be a federal minimum wage for healthcare workers paid from the central budget. For example, in every country, a doctor's minimum gross salary should be, say, 
2000 euros and nurses 1400. Now this wouldn't really affect western countries where salaries are already much higher, but it would make all the difference in countries like Bulgaria, Romania or Hungary or even Poland. Uh, this way we could solve the problem of healthcare workers migrating to the west for better pay, causing severe personal shortages back home. Uh, once again the salaries would not need to be equal across the board, but high enough to prevent public service workers from leaving their home country en masse. I would do the same thing with education actually, have a federal minimum teacher salary and bring schools up to a certain quality standard. A strong economy begins with a strong, well-educated workforce as they say. So I think a European federation would actually be a great solution to wealth inequality because it could shift resources much more efficiently and most importantly it could also check the correct spending of those resources. And there is a mechanism for checking already, uh, called the European Prosecutor's Office, uh, from which member states can opt out freely, including Hungary. I wonder why that is. Boy, it sure sounds like resisting European integration is just a cover for politicians to preserve their power and to keep up their domestic corruption schemes without anyone able to stop them. Speaking of which, let us now talk about the national sovereignty argument. Now, national sovereignty in the face of European integration is a great lie that many still believe. Leaders like Orban tell people that more European integration will take power away from them. Them as in the people. In reality, if we federalized everything tomorrow, the people would still have democratic control over their decision makers, whether local or federal. The only tangible difference would be that people like Orban could no longer reign supreme within their borders. The local political ruling class would actually have some oversight. And so national sovereignty is a neat rhetorical trick used by politicians to make people believe that the local politicians losing some power is equivalent to the electorate losing power. Now this would be true if the political power was transferred to a dictatorship, but in this case we are only transferring some functions from a local democratic government to a central democratic government. Now the national sovereignty argument is a form of so-called EU bashing, which is the political equivalent of reactionary anti-SJW content which can be summarized as follows. No real arguments, just vague gesturing against imagined hypocrisy. And uh, this neat definition comes from Walsh as far as I can tell, you'll find the link to his channel in the description. But the thing about EU bashing is that it's kind of getting old, uh, people aren't so quick to jump on the bandwagon and are increasingly seeing it for what it is, a cheap political trick to divert attention from domestic problems. So as we can see, the national sovereignty argument doesn't really hold up. The next big argument is about cultural differences, namely that European cultures are simply too different to work together on such a high level. So the federalization of Europe is based on a very important realization. Let me explain. I was born in Hungary and I have a bunch of relatives in the countryside who live in villages in the east. When I visit them I find that I have nothing in common with them or the people around them and we have vastly different ideas about virtually everything. We eat different food, we enjoy different entertainment, we consume different media, we definitely have different drinking habits, we have different mannerisms, the list goes on. Basically the Hungarian language is the only thing we have in common. In contrast, when I studied for a year in Germany on my Erasmus scholarship, I got to meet people like me, young, college age, middle class, with whom I had a lot in common. And those people were from all over Europe, north and south, east and west, almost every European country was represented there. And virtually the only tangible difference between us was our native languages. But we all spoke English. So by virtue of all of us there being highly educated educated middle class young adults, I had much more in common with people from northern Finland, southern Spain or even eastern Russia than with my Hungarian relatives living a few hours away. And mind you, many of those Hungarian relatives are the same age as I. So this cultural differences argument doesn't really add up. It's just simply outdated. It would have made some sense in the 1950s or 60s, but ever since then the world has become much more interconnected. Alright, so the next argument we're going to be looking at is language. Namely that Europe has no real common language and people People being unable to communicate with each other would lead to chaos. Or you know, there's just not enough linguistic cohesion for a European federation. Now this argument is a big one, however it also suffers from the same problem as the cultural argument, namely that it's becoming more and more outdated. Now this argument would have been fair a few decades ago, but in our current day and age English is very quickly becoming the common language of Europe. Uh, sorry friends. Even in the most English illiterate countries a good fifth of the population speaks it already. And with the internet and our increasingly global culture, culture, these percentages will only go up. The common administrative language inside a European federation would of course be English. Uh, in fact, in the current European Union it already pretty much is. Uh, sorry friends, again. 
This means that a federal European government would not be affected by a language barrier, and I would make sure by making English courses part of public sector employment. The government pays for a private teacher or something to come by and teach for a few hours each week for free as part of the employee's work time. And in practice, this would mean that every government office would have all forms and all services available in the local language plus in English. And so this leaves us with the general populace outside of the public sphere. Now, would there be a linguistic problem? I don't think so. People already live in areas where they can access everything in their own native languages, and this would be the same under a European Federation, and there could only be problems if people would want to leave those areas and go to other areas where there's another language. But the people who do move around are usually the ones who already speak foreign languages. Here in Germany, for example, I've met a lot of fellow Hungarians who work here. They all speak German or English, and they have no linguistic issues whatsoever. Now, as an important side note, some industries at this point do not really require knowledge of the local language. Uh, for a lot of occupations like finance, IT or even some blue collar jobs like trucking, English is often enough. So with all this being said, I don't think the Federal Europe idea would topple over because of language. It could become a problem here and there, but it could still be handled through policy. At the end of the day, the most important thing is that the government has a common language, which at this point it pretty much does. So this problem has really been solved by the circumstances, I would say, and so I'm not especially worried about it. Alright, so let's move on to the ultimate argument, the biggest one. Namely, European states differing geopolitical interests. Now this right here is the most important argument of them all. And to properly address it, I'll be rolling it into why I think a European federation is absolutely necessary. Alright, so why do I think that a European federation is absolutely necessary? At the end of the day, it all comes down to more efficient use of resources, both tangible and non-tangible. For example, a federal Europe should have a unified military. Instead of dozens of smaller armies operating separately, let's have a common command structure. A unified European military would be much more effective, i.e. much more stronger, for the same amount of money. And with an active war currently ongoing, on European soil, meaning the war in Donbass, I think it's an absolute necessity. Another hugely important aspect is common finances. A unified tax policy to end tax havens, uh, looking at you Ireland, and things like more efficient control over budget spending. It's much easier to track corruption, it turns out, if certain states can't just opt out of the anti-corruption measure. In practice, common finances would mean the aforementioned, plus a federal budget for federal issues and local budgets for local issues. Also, something else that's also very important is a common defense force and a asylum system. If Europe had a well-organized network of refugee camps and a unified border force, the 2015 refugee crisis would not have been so severe, I believe, and thus the consequent far-right resurgence wouldn't have happened. It was pretty amazing to see how quickly the EU's refugee system folded back in the day, mostly because individual countries started pushing the refugees onto each other instead of working together. There was a quota system developed to help distribute some refugees among member states, but far-right-led countries of course started screaming about it immediately. Hungary, for example, ended up suffering a complete national mental breakdown over it uh, for having to house 1294 migrants and only until their asylum applications are processed. Oh, and here by Hungary I mean of course the Hungarian government and its supporters. Uh, speaking of the refugee crisis, a unified federal police could track crime across borders more efficiently, including terrorism. A federal secret service could process all the intel much better instead of having dozens of small secret services operating parallel to each other. So we won't have things like the Hungarian secret service not noticing Salah Abdeslam, the Pataklan massacre's organizer, buying 200,000 SIM cards in Budapest. Yes, that actually happened. I even have a video about it, feel free to check it out. Alright, so, I promised I would get to the geopolitical interests argument, so here it is. Under my community post, a lot of you have correctly identified this as a problem. However, I'll be approaching this issue from the other way around. Europe is indeed full of clashing geopolitical interests. For example, Poland is staunchly anti-Russian, while Hungary's Viktor Orban has a VIP entry card into Putin's pants. Germany is also quite ambivalent on the Russia question since its industry depends on Russian gas. Most EU member states are against China or view it as a rival, while Viktor Orban openly collaborates with them. A united European geopolitical front, I believe, is the most important thing to have right now. Our neighbor Russia, though on the decline, is an increasingly oppressive oil monarchy with nuclear weapons, one that currently engages in active warfare on European soil. China is a totalitarian tech dystopia and a new global superpower. India is an upcoming superpower. I guess they couldn't do it by 2020, but it's coming still. Even if Russia collapsed to tomorrow and the war in Donbass ended, that still leaves us with China and India as rivals. 
as they grow stronger, I don't think European countries will be able to do anything against their influence unless they present a unified front. People don't really realize the insane power potential these countries have. Uh, for the sake of perspective, Slovenia has a population of 2 million, Hungary 10 million, Germany 83 million, meanwhile India has 1,366 million and China 1,398 million. Now of course number of people is not the end all be all, but they serve as a good basis for future power. And people are resources after all, human resources. Alone, European countries are just figures on the chessboard of global powers. Together they can become a global power themselves. Gone are the times when the UK, Germany or France alone could be a significant force on the global stage. We are now entering a new age of global powers. So far Europe could surf the waves of US hegemony, but new players are coming to the table. And because of this a united European front is necessary. Now I can see why people would find the idea of a European federation strange, scary or even outright impossible. It's actually natural to feel that way ahead of every major paradigm shift in governance. I imagine people must have felt the same way about the first European nation state back in the day, uh, how it's impossible for a country to last outside of Vatican influence, how Henry VIII is too much of an idealist, how the Anglican church will tear England apart and so on. But in the end it worked out pretty okay. Uh, until June 2016 that is. Alright, so now all of you should have a much better idea about how a federal Europe would look like. But what are the chances for the emergence of a federal Europe? Well, they're pretty good, I must say. Currently, support for the EU is pretty much green, or I should say blue, across the board. Also, crucially, most people in most European countries want more decisions to be taken on the EU level. It seems like people would support a reasonable re-delegation of power to EU institutions. And I think a common foreign policy would be such a measure. And also a common military, a common fiscal policy, and common non-optional anti-corruption institutions, among other things. And once again, none of this is science fiction. Most people in most European European countries trust all major European institutions. The EU's trust rating is finally recovering after the 2008-2009 economic crisis. And in recent years, COVID-19 has only shown people the need for even closer European integration. Common EU vaccine procurement was generally a success, despite the rough start. The idea was that European countries together have much much more leverage than alone when negotiating with pharma companies. And well, you know, duh. Alright, so let us now move on to the last section, namely how I would have the federalization process play out. One word incrementally. The measures I've mentioned would of course take years upwards to a decade to implement. I don't want to do any of these things uh, just overnight. I want to make a plan for deeper integration, start executing it in phases and correct the course if something doesn't seem to be working out. And I do think it will be extremely important to sell this idea to people, gradually. Now normally I don't think an idea like this would need to be sold, since it has objective, tangible benefits that any reasonable person would want. The problem, as always, is the reactionary counter campaign that will inevitably follow, or a disinformation propaganda to use a non-PC term. You know, the UK's EU membership had tangible, objective benefits that any reasonable person would want. And oh boy, how's that Brexit thing working out so far, huh? So you know, I'd like to congratulate all the leave campaigners, as they have shown, mindless gesturing against imagined hypocrisy is a very effective political tool. The entire leave campaign was built on this, and to their dismay they actually succeeded. Their most iconic slogan in fact was a complete lie, and people need to be equipped against this. The disinformation that is, the source of which nowadays is an increasingly reactionary modern conservatism. Oh, now I'll have to make a video about this, won't I? So anyway, as we've seen, the federalization of Europe wouldn't be the founding of the galactic empire or something, it would be a set of mostly bureaucratic processes, building upon what has already been done so far, which would affect our local political ruling classes first and foremost. And I do believe people will only benefit from this. Oh and also, when the next capital riot actually succeeds, the free world would need to be led by someone else. So thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this uh, reworked take on the European Federation, and thank you once again for all your responses in my community section. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll be seeing you next time.